So we are here at the Feast of Tabernacles, the Jerusalem Parade, with people coming from Japan. And you can see we're from Japan and we keep Torah. They are actually keeping the five books of Moses. And this is so beautiful to see them with the lovely kimonos. We love you, Japan. Welcome to Israel. You are from, you are from the Makoya? Nippon. Nippon. That's right. Well done. Beautiful. You know the House of Destiny? Oh, yeah. You, you follow, follow us? Yo, yes, really? yes, yes. <laughs> so what is my name? You remember? I am Doobie. Doobie yes. That's right. And you used to follow Kim Clement? Really? Yes. All the way from Japan? Yes. What is your yes. name? Oh, my name Mom Chinese. Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. But you follow Kim Clement Yo, and the yes, House of Destiny? Yes. This is amazing. Look at this beautiful lady. Do you understand the influence that the House of Destiny and the Israel partnership has over this world? This is a lady all the way, I thought from Japan, but she was actually from China. This was so restricted in China to go and follow and be Christian. And yet they were just meeting in secret places, reading the Torah, reading the Bible. It's just incredible. And the lady now in the open, she was admitting she knows the house of destiny. She's a follower of Kim Clement. This is unbelievable to see the love and support that people has and the reach that we have so far away. She noticed the logo and she noticed the fact that we are from the house of destiny and that's just incredible you see people coming from south africa it's so pretty and people coming from denmark people coming from china people coming from all over the world this is just beautiful beautiful demonstration of love and support to the land of israel and the people of israel thousands and thousands and dozens of thousands of people on their walk all the way down to the western wall to the welling wall She's blowing the shofar right now. Welcome, welcome to Israel. Chag Sameach. Norway, you see? Very, very good. That's right. Heart over the old world. Amen. Thank you so much, yes. sir. And Israel loves you back. Yes. Where, where in Norway are you we, from? We, Oslo. Oslo, beautiful city. Yes, from we love Oslo. Thank you. Because we love Israel. We have been here 60 years. Wow, thank you so much. Hallelujah, sir. This is what we mean when we say there is a big shifting in the heavens towards the land of Israel, the people of Israel, the chosen land of Israel. As people come here, they get the habitation of knowing the way to go to the mountain of the Lord, to make it a house of prayer for all the nations of the world. And this is getting ready for this time when Messiah will come and all of us will make it to rapture, be dancing and worshiping and having a great time in Jerusalem forever. Welcome to the Israel Update. Thank you so much for being here with us. Today is going to be all about covenants. And I know that this is going to be incredible for all of us. Let's go. If you've been around Christians, you've probably heard of the idea of having a personal relationship with God, which could mean different things in the Bible, like having God as a friend or your father or maybe your teacher. But there's one particular way that the Bible talks about this relationship that you find all over. But strangely, we don't talk about it that much. And that's the idea of a partnership with God. A partnership like working alongside someone to accomplish a goal together. Right, and this is actually what you see at the beginning of the Bible. God creates this good world full of all of this potential. And then God appoints these unique creatures, humans, as his partners in bringing more and more goodness out of all that potential. But the humans don't want to partner with God. They rebel and try to create a world on their own terms. And so this broken partnership is the Bible's explanation for why we're stuck in a world of corruption and injustice and the tragedy of death. It's not like there's just one or two humans who have bailed on this relationship. In the story of the Bible, everyone has abandoned the partnership with God. So what God does is select a smaller group of people out of the many, and he makes a new partnership with them called a covenant. And in a covenant, God makes promises, and then in exchange asks his partner to fulfill certain commitments. And the purpose of all of this is to somehow use this covenant relationship to renew his partnership with everybody else. Now, there are actually four times in the Old Testament that we're told God initiates a covenant relationship with Noah, Abraham, the nation of Israel, and King David. And it's through these that God is forming a covenant family into which all people will eventually be invited. So let's see how these work. The first one is with Noah. So in this story, God has just brought the flood to cleanse the world of humanity's corruption. And Noah and his family are the only ones left. And so God makes a covenant with Noah saying, listen, 
I know that humans will continue to be evil, but despite that, I'm not going to destroy it like this again. Instead, the Earth will be this reliable place for us to work together. Great, so what does Noah have to do? Nothing. And that's what's so interesting about this first covenant is that God is promising to be faithful even though he knows humans won't be. The next time we see God make a covenant is with a man named Abraham. God chooses him, promises to bless him, give him a large family, lots of land where they can flourish. And in return, God asks Abraham to trust him and train up his family to do what is right and just. And the whole reason for this covenant is God says that somehow he's going to bring his blessing to all families of the world through this one family. So that's Abraham. The next time we see God make a covenant is when Abraham's family grows into the tribe of Israel. And this covenant is with the whole tribe. God asks them to obey a set of laws, which are these guidelines for living well as a community of God's partners. And if they do this, then God promises to bless them and that they will become a people who then represent him to the rest of humanity. That's the covenant with Israel. The last covenant is with King David. Yeah, the tribe of Israel has become this large nation ruled by David. And God asked David and his descendants to partner with him by leading Israel and obeying the laws and doing what is right and just. And God promises that one day, one of David's sons will come and extend God's kingdom of peace and blessing over all the nations. So those are the four covenants that God makes in order to restore his partnership with the whole world. But here's what happens. Israel breaks the covenant. They worship other gods, they allow horrible injustice, and so they lose their land and are forced off into exile. So it seems hopeless. But during this time, Israel's prophets talked about a day when God would restore these covenants in spite of Israel's failure, somehow. Yeah, they called it the New Covenant. And this is actually what's so interesting about Jesus, is that he's introduced into this story as the one who fulfills all of these covenant relationships. We're told that he's from the family of Abraham, and so he will bring the blessings of that family to the whole world. We're told that he's the faithful Israelite who was able to truly obey the law. And we're told that he's the king from the line of David. And so he goes about extending God's kingdom of justice and peace to all. And that's really remarkable for one guy. Yeah, and what it highlights is perhaps the most surprising claim of all made about this man, that Jesus is no mere human, but rather God become human. And God did this in order to be that faithful covenant partner that we are all made to be, but have failed to be. And so through Jesus, God has opened up a way for anyone to be in a renewed partnership with him. So Jesus calls people to follow him and become part of this new covenant family. And despite their failures, Jesus is committed to making them into partners who are becoming more and more faithful. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a fully renewed world, full of goodness and peace. And there's this renewed humanity there, partnering together with God to expand the goodness of his creation. And so the end of the Bible story is really a new beginning. Israel Update is brought to you by the generous supporters of the Israel Partnership. Because of their love for Israel, we are able to bring you this show and continue to sow into the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. For more information on how to become a sustaining partner, please click the Israel Partner banner below. Hi everybody and welcome to our Israel Update. Today, I'm incredibly privileged to be joined by the amazing Vas Innocent. And um, we're gonna be speaking a lot today about covenants and what they mean. So welcome Lars, thank you so much for being with me today. It's a pleasure, thank you. And um, you know, I just really wanted to get your perspective. This whole kind of show and series is about God choosing Israel, the importance of Israel, what she means for us today. And so I just wanted to get your perspective on the importance and significance of covenant as seen in the Old Testament specifically. And I just wanted to get some of your thoughts about that. Well, yes, uh, the Bible, of course, is a book about covenants. Um, The word testament is not a biblical term. It's unlikely that it came into our translations via the Latin. But uh, so the terms Old and New Testaments are not really biblical terms because a testament is a relationship 
that, um, or actually not a relationship, but it is something that a deceased person leave after himself. It goes into effect when a person has, has died. Um, but a covenant is a relationship. It, it, it describes a relationship between, between two parties. And uh, because God is not dead, so he has not given us a testament. Uh, he has established covenants, and those covenants for his part, they are eternal. They will never be broken. Um, the covenants we see in the so-called Old Testament, if we use that term, uh, it, uh, it was usually a blood covenant. It was until death. It had to be established through a sacrifice, uh, and then um, the people usually walked between the pieces of the sacrifice and and they made a blood covenant that would uh, mean that uh, they entered into a relationship where they committed to one another that everything the other party has is now yours and everything you have uh, is now theirs. So. Um, that is the kind of relationship that God has with his people. It is a, it is a, a relationship that can never be annulled. It can never be broken. Uh, it is forever. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, I love your perspective on this and I love the way that you explain things. And, you know, one of the parallels that I, I'm kind of trying to draw here is people today don't really have an understanding of this whole concept of covenant because even if we look at marriage or anything, people kind of just opt out when things get tough so quickly in our culture and in this generation. And so um, would you be able to just speak to us a little bit more about what what it means that the covenant God has with Israel is eternal, uh, what that means in, in, to you and in your perspective, kind of looking at the Bible as a whole um, from Genesis right through to Revelation. What do you, what do you see that meaning, um, an eternal covenant with the people of Israel? Yeah, well, if we know first of all that God, there are different covenants in the Bible. The, the covenant uh, we see first is the covenant with Noah. Yeah. And there was a sign uh, of the rainbow with that covenant where God promised that, that he would never destroy the earth with a flood ever again. And he put a sign of that covenant in the sky and that was the rainbow. So that is an, a covenant that will last as long as um, heaven and earth stands. Then we have the next covenant described, and that's the covenant that God made with Abraham. And it's a covenant that he established by an oath. He swore by himself. He could not swear by any higher uh, that he would uh, keep his covenant with Abraham forever and never break it. Um, we have then the third covenant. Uh, it's the Mosaic covenant that was established between God and Israel after the exodus from Egypt. Now, that covenant we read in the Bible, it was broken by Israel. And so God uh, threatened to destroy the people because they had broken covenant with him. However, Moses pleaded with God uh, on the basis of the covenant that he had made with Abraham which was a non-conditional covenant forever that God uh, declared he would never break. So um, because Moses could refer back to that covenant, God had to honor it and spare the people. So uh, the covenant that was um, broken with uh, Israel, uh, as far as the, the Torah, when it was given on Sinai, um, that is a covenant that that then God had to refer back to the older covenant with Abraham. Uh, and throughout the rest of the scriptures, we know that is a covenant that God will never break. I'm thinking about the um, passage in Jeremiah, where it says in, um, uh, in chapter 31, it says um, from verse 35, I'm reading from the New International Version here. It's usually not a version I, I 
use in my teaching, but it's what I will use here now. It says, this is what the Lord says, he who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. Um, this is what the Lord says, only if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be searched out, will I reject the descendants of Israel because of all they have done, declares the Lord. So um, that is very powerful. Now, we can also go to another passage that is very, very strong in um, Psalm 105. Um, it's actually a passage that the Jewish people quote every morning in their prayers. Um, it says from verse 5, in Psalm 105, Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. O descendants of Abraham, his servant, O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word he commanded for a thousand generations the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. So here we see uh, that in the covenant God made with Israel, uh, he, he committed himself uh, to uh, allot the land of Canaan forever to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that is a very powerful passage of, of Scripture that shows that God is a covenant-keeping God. He will never break His covenant. Some people, many Christians, I, I would say, they think that, you know, just because there is a new covenant, it means that the old covenant is no longer uh, valid or um, that it has done away with, with the old covenant. But God will never do away with any covenant, but he can renew covenants. And that's what he did uh, in the new covenant. It's the word in the Greek can also, and I think it should rather be translated, the renewed covenant, because that's what the Greek word also means. It can be translated new covenant or renewed covenant. Because Israel broke the first covenant when they came out of Egypt, God said, I will make a new covenant. And that new covenant is made also with Israel and the Jewish people. The wonderful thing about the new covenant is that we, who are not uh, natural descendants of Abraham, we're not physically Jewish or uh, Israelis, we have a part in this new covenant that he made with Israel. So that is something that is also um, described in Jeremiah 31, earlier in the chapter where we read, but also quoted in uh, Hebrews chapter 8, the renewed covenant that God has made with uh, Israel. He's not made it. In fact, this is very important also to understand. God has never there's nothing in the Bible that says that God has made a new covenant with the church. Um, all, the covenants, all the covenants that we see in the Bible, except the one that he made with Noah before Abraham, there are all the other covenants they are established between God and Israel. So maybe we need to read that from the New Testament to make sure everybody can follow along here. Um, from Hebrews chapter 8, it says uh, from verse 7, For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. Verse 8, But God found fault with the people uh, and said, 
The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. And here we have it described now, the new covenant, what it is. With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Uh, I can stop there. So we see that the, this new covenant that is described, uh, actually it is established already in the Old Testament and it's quoted here in the New Testament. It is a renewed covenant between God and the people of Israel. The very people he made the first covenant with is the same people that he had made, has made the new covenant with. And um, But because of being born again uh, by the Spirit of God, we ha have become joint heirs with Israel in this new covenant. So that is the wonderful thing about uh, this new covenant that we also have a part in, of in it, even though we're not physically uh, from the nation of Israel. Thank you so much for joining me today, Lars. We're so, so grateful to have you on the show. Thank you. Well, you are welcome. And uh, I hope that uh, people would be interested in following my weekly teaching there on Messiah and the Torah. Uh, I think they will uh, be very blessed by that as well. I couldn't agree more and let me encourage you if you're watching in our Israel partnership. Lars has done this incredible set of teachings called Messiah and the Torah and I cannot actually encourage you enough to join that partnership. It's a way to sow into Israel and bless Israel directly. It's $18 a month. It's the, the number of life of Chai. And we don't only have Lars's amazing teachings, Messiah and the Torah, but there's so many updates that come from Dubi from around Israel. And there's a whole bunch of other content. So let me encourage you, go and check it out and join our Israel partnership. You will not be disappointed with the amazing content that we have in there.